Well, we are going to look at uh, Jeremiah. I really encourage you to have your Bibles because I'm going to summarize a few things and you better check me. Make sure that I don't say anything that's off. We're going to be in Jeremiah 29, but I'm going to summarize a few other verses as well. But to kick us off, I want us to think about something. Have you ever, or or, or here's the question, how do you respond when things don't go your way? Some of you maybe handled that really well, others don't. About two weeks ago, I was at Walmart, and if you were there when I was, you know what happened because you heard it. There was probably a, a four-year-old, maybe a five-year-old kid, not a, not, a, not a baby, not an infant, but a kid who I thought was old enough that shouldn't be behaving this way, but this kid was going ballistic. You ever been at Walmart and heard a kid go ballistic? This kid was like, and now I, I didn't even see the kid at first. It, this child was a few aisles over, but I'm, I was like, my ears were, were hurting. And this kid was screaming, pick me up, pick me up, pick me up, mommy. Wanted mommy to pick this kid up. And then finally, uh, you know, my search for for Q-tips brought us together in the same aisle. And there I was witnessing this kid just clinging to this poor mother, begging to pick me up pick me up. And I'll say this about the, you know, the mother had the lifeless eyes. She had given up hope. (laughs) But but I I applaud the mom for this. Either she didn't have strength to do it anymore, but she was like a rock. She's like the kid didn't even exist. And I applaud that because if a kid throws a tantrum and you respond by giving them what they want, what are they going to do the next time they want something? They're going to throw a tantrum. So I applaud this mother who may not have had the energy to respond anyway, but she did not respond to the kid's tantrum. And I was very happy to finally leave that environment where that was happening. And it made me think, I think that we act like that all the time with God. I mean, think about this for a moment. I think that at times we expect God to pick us up when we're acting like babies, when we, and God is gracious. God is a gracious Savior. He carries the children, he, and He loves it when we come to Him. But He does not want to endorse behavior or an attitude and behavior that's all entitled or tantrum or baby-like. And I think a lot of times we come to God with that expectation, and God's like, I don't want to pick you up right now. You need to learn not to act like a baby. There needs to be some refinement take place. And This morning, I want to talk about Jeremiah 29, and I'm going to start with the verse that you've probably heard before. Jeremiah 29, 11, it says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Oh, yeah, that'll preach. Claim that. Hang that up on your, your, you know, your wall or a plaque. You know, we love this. This is the verse that we claim for our kids. We, we got the t-shirt made somewhere, the Christian t-shirt. We love this verse. We love to share this verse. And we certainly should pray verses or things about Jeremiah 29, 11. I, I believe that this verse can inform many areas. However, I probably would say maybe the most or one of the most taken out of context verses in all of Scripture. And the reason is because I think Jeremiah 29, 11 has a lot less to do with God wanting to bless our plans and our futures and a lot more of us understanding God's plan for the nation of Israel and His redemptive plan to use us to bless others. I think it's something we, we miss. Here's a graphic. It's from the YouVersion Bible app. It has over 400 million downloads by this point. This was from like 2014. It was the most uh, shared verses. You can see Jeremiah 29, 11, all over the world was one of the most shared verses. We love Jeremiah 29, 11. And if you Google right now, you could Google most shared Bible verses or most shared Uh, and memorized Bible verse, whatever list of top 10 lists, Jeremiah 29, 11 is typically on that list. We love it. We love God's going to bless us, give us this future. 
So the problem is, is we love to take it out of context. We love to pick the verse we like and, and take it out of context. Give an example. I, Adam Feathers and I played in a disc golf tournament yesterday. We both got second place, right? Adam, are you here? Second place, confirmation. Adam got second place from the top down. I got second place from the bottom up. <laughs> but we both got second place. That's how I see it, right? Context matters. You know, <laughs> you can say something that sounds right by itself, but context informs statements. And context will inform this statement that we love to take and isolate by itself. So I encourage you to open your Bibles and follow along. I'm going to be summarizing a lot, a little history. I, I mentioned when we first started Jeremiah, there was five kings that Jeremiah served under the, the fourth king, Jehoiachin. He was deported to Babylon in 597 B.C. When he was deported to Babylon, there were several other familiar people you know, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all these guys. With, with 10,000 other people from Jerusalem deported, Nebuchadnezzar had exiled them. He appointed Zedekiah, a new king over Judah. And it's in this window because Judah is eventually 11 years later in 586 BC, Jerusalem is destroyed. But in that window between the time that the exiles were taken and Nebuchadnezzar destroys the, the city in 586, Jeremiah sends a letter to the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, the elders who were taken, those 10,000. He sends a letter and in that season, if you look at chapter 28, you'll find there's a prophet, Hanani, who's saying, all right, they finally realize Jeremiah's right, because Jeremiah's been saying, Jeremiah's been preaching, Babylon's going to come in and win the day. And they're like, we're God's people, we got the temple, we got all this stuff, and, and the things keep happening. And it sounds like Jeremiah's the bad guy. Jeremiah, why don't you believe in God? Don't you trust in what God can do? And Jeremiah's like, God's going to punish you. You've been sinning. He's not going to bless this. He's not going to endorse this. You've, you've been whining. Babylon's coming, and then, and then in chapter 28, Hannah and I was like, okay, they're coming, but they're only going to be here for two years, and then God's going to restore Jerusalem. And Jeremiah writes this in 29, so let's frame the context for the verse that we love to quote. Here it is, verse 1. These are the words of the letters that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And if you've got your Bible open, you'll see lists of names in verses 2 and 3. And then he gives us verse 4. Ready? I just want to say I was right. I told you, but you were idiots, and now you're stuck in Babylon like I said you would. Hashtag Jeremiah wins. While you are there, you should make the most of your time by complaining about how good it was back in Jerusalem. Be critical of everyone who has a different view of, than yours, because those pagans really are wrong, so make sure they know about it every chance you get. Be a hero and seek the destruction of the city because it is so evil. At least you'll finally feel like saints compared to them. I told you you better have your Bible, make sure. <laughs> that is a Roy's heretic version. I like to bring that out every now and then. That's not what the Bible says. That's actually what I would probably want to say if it were me writing the letter. But what's ironic is that Jeremiah, he was a true prophet, so he didn't write what he thought. He wrote what God wanted him to say. And what's ironic is what the Bible says sounds more unbelievable Look, this is actually what the Bible says. This isn't a trick. It might sound like it, but follow along in your Bible. Verse 4 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into the exile, into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. In other words, God is making it clear this is not going to be just a two-year short-term international trip or short-term trip to a foreign country like Hannah and I was prophesying. He wants them to be responsible, contribute, contributing citizens in Babylon. He goes on to share how they are to influence the city. Verse 6, take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, just generations he's talking here, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. 
but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in the exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now pause for a minute. I don't think that any of these Hebrew children, any of the Israelites, anyone was in Jerusalem having a small group, quoting Jeremiah 29 11, talking about the wonderful plans that they're going to have someday. And, and Bill was like, you know what, Bob, I believe what I'd like to do, instead of doing the white picket fence in the house here, is I'd really like to uh, go up to Babylon, you know, the, the worst place in the world, and start a family up there. I believe I'd like to go as a prisoner. <laughs> that would work out. And try to influence that city and, and pray for that. That was not on the radar. That is what the plan was. God is going to discipline his people, and he's going to bless their city. God wants them to live missionally. Notice the three things in that. He wants them to multiply themselves there. He wants them to get involved to better their city, and he wants them to pray to the Lord for the city. He wants them to live missionally. This would not have been on anybody's plan in Jerusalem. They were going to the temple. They weren't like, I want to go to the worst place in the world and multiply there, make that city better, and pray to the Lord for those people. And here's the thing. Hebrews 13, 8 talks about this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore meaning that he has the same agenda for us today, that I think that we need to be a people that multiply ourselves in our cities to make our cities better and to pray to the Lord to influence our, our spheres of influence. And then God warns them that religious people will take them off mission. Look at verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners among, or who are among you deceive you And do not listen to their dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. And here we go. For thus saith the Lord, when 70 years are complete, completed for Babylon, I will send you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. This plan that that we love to quote in its context was a plan to send God's people to the worst place on the planet for 70 years to live missionally and then to return from captivity to Jerusalem. That's the context of this verse. And then verse 12 says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to this place from which I sent you into exile. So we've been talking about this series, how do we live obedient in a disobedient country? In Part of it is that we stop whining like little kids, like (laughs) in Walmart, and get on board with God's plan. That's what Jeremiah 29 is all about. It's not about hijacking a verse and taking it out of context so that we can endorse the agenda we want. It's about recognizing God's plan, getting on board with it, not whining and watching God do something. It's about praying for others, getting involved in your city where you're at, and multiplying yourself through investing in others. So here's a couple of thoughts for uh, application. And you could pull, this is in your card as well, so I know the screen's down technology, but, but you can find these in your card. So look at your connection card and you'll see these. Memorize Jeremiah 29 11. Understanding the context. So that means that perhaps God's plan for you, God's greater plan for your life, life might look a lot more like an exile in Babylon than a worshiper in Jerusalem. Recognizing that our family, we support various missions, ministries, and things like that. And some of my favorite ministries to support are those that reach out to people in hard-to-reach places. 
Uh, we support a Christian rapper, Lamar Riddick. We, we love what Lamar does. And what, one of the things I like about it is, is I've watched him interact with people that would never go in church. And I've, I've heard him share the gospel and reach out. I've heard uh, Ken Hawkins, who has a church for addicts. Now, you're talking about some strange issues that go on through the week. This church for addicts really recovered. They reach out to the, the, the least of these. People that would not come to our church or people that might not feel uh, as comfortable, there's these ministries that really help them push forward. And so it is, it is so exciting to watch people who, who answer God's call, and they're really in, in like a Babylon type of ministry where they're trying to represent God in cultures that are very fallen. Another thing to do is identify someone who is hard to love and pray that God would bless them. Yes, I said that right. So identify someone who is hard to love and pray that God would bless them. Uh, I bet when I said that, somebody probably thought of someone who can be hard to love sometimes. (laughs) But the truth is, problems require solutions. Problems require the right solution in order to solve the problem. You know, you've got to have the right solution. So, in other words, if you're like, yeah, I really want to be generous, but I struggle with greed, then part of the solution is you have to start giving. You start giving, and that begins to break down the barriers of the greed that's, that's, that, that's being there in your heart to soften that. Or, for example, if you want to care about others more, but you feel selfish all the time, start serving. You'll see that the heart will soften towards that. And the truth is, is if you want your heart to change towards people that, that are difficult and hard to love when you're around them, start praying that God will bless them and watch what happens in your own heart. Let me, this was a really funny story story happened to me last night as I was reviewing my talk notes. And when I got to this, I wondered if I would be lying to you when I said it. So I'm like, God, is it true that if I really pray for people that are hard to love, that God will bless them, that it'll change my perspective? So I thought of someone that was really hard to love in my life. There was a person that that surfaced to the top of the list, and they were at the top of the list I'm just going to be really honest because they, they're in trouble all the time and they need help all the time and, and, and financially we've helped them a lot and it's been frustrating to me that they're always in this situation. So I started praying, God, bless this person, bless them financially and I'm praying all these prayers. This is like 10 p.m. last night. I get a call from this person while I am praying for them. I honest, I'm in my office, 10 o'clock get a call from this person while I'm praying that God would bless, us, bless them. This person called to tell me that their boss gave them a raise from $18 an hour to $22 an hour. I'm like, I was praying for you. <laughs> I'm like, I will use this tomorrow. It does work. I will. I'll tell them, God. It, pray for p- people that are hard to love. Pray for them that God would bless them. And that's hard to do because you want to pray, said we call down fire Lord type prayers because they frustrate us. Pray that God would bless them and see what it does in your own life. And the last thing is regularly pray for leaders of our country, our state, local community. I want to read 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. I want you to notice this. It says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for all those who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Do you want to make sure you're pleasing God? This verse tells us. We pray for our leaders. And it talks about the, the posture and the thankfulness and the things that we should pray. But it, there's, there, if you want to know how to please God, that's part of it. So we need to pray for our country. Let me pray for us now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for Jer- uh, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. Thank you that you have a plan and you do want to bless us. And God, we recognize, though, that your ways aren't our ways, that we have our own agendas. And so we ask that you would help us to align our hearts to yours. We want to pray for President Biden. We want to pray for Governor Jim Justice. We want to pray for our mayor and and the people in our city. We pray for Ron Delaney, and we pray for those that 
that God, that we would help our local government, our state, and our nation trust you, that we would be salt and light. God, I confess and pray that you would forgive me for whining instead of winning by seeking your face and praying for these people and praying that you would bless them. God, would you help us to serve you in these things? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want us to prepare ourselves for communion. I would ask that you would take the elements. Notice there's two, two things that need peeled. And so in just a moment, we're just going to give you a, a season to reflect. So you can go ahead and peel that off. And at this time, just take a minute or so just to reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf when he died on the cross. So take these next few moments to reflect, and I'll give us some instructions in a moment. believe that God has blessed us so that we could be a blessing to others. And the only reason we can really have a heart that will care for others is when we recognize God's love for us. I mean, we love God because he first loved us, and he showed and demonstrated his love for us on the cross. And so take the bread, take the, the wafer that's symbolic, representing Jesus' body that was beaten, that was crucified for us, Take it and with a thankful heart, as an act of worship, take the bread in remembrance of Christ's death for us. Jesus also instructed his disciples at the Last Supper. He took the, the fruit of the vine, the juice, and he said, this is my blood, the new covenant, which we're going to be talking about next week. I'm so excited to get to that section in Jeremiah that talks about the new covenant. But the new covenant is because Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood for the remission of sin so that you and I could have life. And so we reflect on that price that Jesus paid that we can't afford. And with thankful hearts, let's take the juice together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jeremiah. We thank you most of all for this new covenant founded in your blood, God, that you went to the cross to die for our sins so that we could have eternal life. And God, we don't want to just go through the motions. We don't want this to be just some religious ritual without meaning, but we want to be humbled. We want to be thankful. We want to recognize that you paid a price that we couldn't pay, and so we're, we're thankful. And God, we pray that we would walk worthy of the gospel, we would walk in the power of the Spirit, and that you would lead, guide, and direct every area of our lives so that we could honor you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In a moment, we're going to sing a, a final song. I would ask, though, that you would fill this out, that if you have not filled out your connection card, that you will take time to do that so that on the way out, you can drop those in the basket. You can write the next steps on here or check the next steps. We would love to be in prayer, prayer for you. So take time to do that before you leave, and then we'd love to meet any guests out in the foyer by the Welcome Center, and we'll have people to pray with you at the end of the service up here if you're interested in that as well.